Today we're going to be looking at another heavily requested Nile Red video. Specifically, turning cotton balls into cotton candy. By the way, nuclear cotton is a thing talk about that in a bit. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. About two years ago, I became convinced that there was a way to turn cotton balls into edible and hopefully tasty <laughs> cotton candy. At first, this idea seemed Both to be got ridiculous. cotton in the name, right? But I knew that it should have been possible. This is because cotton, even though it doesn't seem like it at all, is technically entirely sugar. The only problem is that all this sugar, true. or more specifically glucose, is trapped in something called cellulose. Mm. As cellulose, it acts like a completely different material, and we can use it to make things like cotton balls and clothing. At its core, though, <laughs> it's all just sugar. So, what I dreamed of doing was breaking down cotton balls back into sugar and then turning them into candy. I didn't just want to make any candy, though, and I specifically wanted to make cotton candy. I wanted to make literal cotton candy. <laughs> to get started, I appreciate the first thing that the I had fun. to do was figure out how to even of course, do it. That's exactly what I you had do. to come up with a way to Google break it. down the cellulose back into sugar, and my first idea was to use an enzyme. This was because I had already used an enzyme for another project where I turned toilet paper into drinkable alcohol and it had worked really well. Now enzymes can actually be used in radiation exposure scenarios, radiation exposure scenarios to assess the level of damage done to cells. DNA repair enzymes can help cells recover from radiation-induced damage. They can also be used in nuclear medicine, in medical imaging, such as uh, PET scans or positron emission topography scans, where, where tracers are tagged to specific molecules to visualize and image certain parts of the body to aid in cancer treatment. Well, for that one, I used an enzyme called cellulase, and I was able to break down the toilet paper, which is also entirely cellulose. This gave me a solution of sugar, Everything which I is fermented sugar. to alcohol using yeast, and then I distilled it to make... Just like everything is nuclear, because everything is atoms that all have atomic nuclei. My toilet paper moonshine. The whole process ended up being surprisingly efficient, and the I figured label. it was the best place to start. The only issue was that the enzyme I had used wasn't pure, and it was mixed with maltodextrin and cornstarch. Both of mm. these were sugars, but they weren't fermentable by yeast, so none of it turned into alcohol, and they didn't at all interfere with that project. However, for this one, I couldn't have any extra sugar floating around. <laughs> extra it would be sugar. almost impossible to separate it from the sugar that I made, and it would just be a huge mess. Sure. I had to find somewhere to buy the pure enzyme, and the easiest and cheapest source seemed to be Alibaba. It was pretty easy to go on, find a listing, and order the enzyme, but actually getting what I wanted turned out to be a huge pain. This one by far Something had to be to the declare. worst one that I got. Customs had apparently torn it open and repackaged it by just throwing it into a loose plastic bag. It was also what? brown, which immediately told me that it wasn't very pure, and I could tell there was sugar in it because it was sticky when I touched it. It took months, but I eventually got one that seemed decent, and it of course arrived as ginseng extract. It was an off-white, but still pure powder, and it didn't seem to have any fillers or sugars. When I tried it on the cotton, though, it just didn't work very well. Okay. I think the enzyme itself was good quality. It's crazy how sketchy some of the shipping practices are. Well, for anything nuclear or even a lot of the chemicals that you get to a plant, they have to follow the utmost Department of Transportation shipping standards, even for things that aren't hazardous, which are very specific about what type of container you have to put it in. And most important thing is just keeping them separate from the stuff that isn't hazardous to the stuff that is hazardous. Because if you put stuff that is hazardous, as far as chemicals are concerned, near stuff that isn't hazardous, guess what? It all becomes hazardous. And then when you're dealing with stuff like transportation of radioactive waste, well, 
you're just going to add another whole layer of security to it, and that's by track by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in addition to the Department of Transportation. So it's interesting to see stuff uh, being thrown in these sketchy little baggies. And the cotton was just really stubborn. I knew that it would be a bit harder to break down than toilet paper, but I didn't expect it to be as bad as it was. I was never really able to do it, and after trying for a while, I basically gave up. About a year later, though, I got really inspired for some reason, Cotton balls are breaking and I the decided internet. to attempt this project again. I read every single book, article, or paper that I could find, and I slowly put something together. My biggest challenge was that I didn't <laughs> want to have to use any specialized equipment or weird chemicals, and I wanted it to be as simple as possible. Of course, just like any good engineer. I also wanted the sugar that I made to taste good, or at the very least, not poison <laughs> me. After about a week, Good I ended up standard. coming up with something that I thought could work. Instead of using enzyme to break down the cotton, I would just use acid, and the process seemed to be surprisingly simple. So I decided to just jump there. right into it, and I picked up an entire bag of cotton balls. I went with the large ones, just because I felt like it, and it looked like a lot, but it was only about 77 grams. Yeah, they're super light. Now, the next main ingredient that I needed was some 98% concentrated sulfuric acid. For all this cotton, I calculated that I needed 230 grams of it, and I poured it directly More acid than cotton. onto Interesting. 70 grams of ice. I guess that makes sense. This almost immediately caused most of the ice to melt, and when it was all added, I turned on the stirring. What I was doing here was just diluting the sulfuric acid okay. yeah. and bringing the concentration down from 98% sure to 75. Water. I also used ice to do this because it generated a lot of heat, and the whole solution was now okay. probably around 60 Cause C, of, of the reaction. or 140 Fahrenheit. That's fair. If I'd used regular water instead of ice, it probably would have violently boiled and splashed, which wouldn't have been ideal. Uh, anything with splashing and using acid, I mean, there's certain types I remember at the plant I worked at with when working with the this isn't so this isn't even the reactor purification loops because that one you stand very far away from because there's potential for high dose. But the ones that you actually had but the area that you had the most acidic acid was in the secondary plant or non nuclear part of the plant with the condensate polishing system. So nuclear power plant makes heat, reactor coolant turns it transfers it to the steam generator, it makes steam, spins the turbine, spins the generator, makes electricity. But that turbine exhaust, when it gets condensed and then sent through the secondary loop back for another cycle, well, over time is going to get dirty. So to clean it up, we have a purification loop in place, involves the use of a sodium hydroxide, hydrazine, some nasty liquid poly stuff, and some ammonia hydroxide. So quite a bit of caustic stuff. You're cl closer to the system, and there's a bit more direct involvement, especially when you uh, regenerate and change out the, uh, the resins for, in the ion exchangers. That's where probably the biggest chemical hazard is, and you need like double eye protection. So your safe, so chemical goggles over your safety glasses, strong chemical resistant gloves, aprons, the works. But you don't really need that in any other part of the plant under normal conditions. But anyway, when it looked like it was all mixed, I turned off the stirring and I let it cool down to room temperature. About thirty minutes later, it was good to go and I pulled out the stir bar. It was now time to add the cotton, and I started with just, just one put ball. In the cotton. I then poked it around a bit, and it almost immediately started falling apart. In general, cotton's oh, wow. usually pretty tough, and I thought that it was interesting to see it just disintegrate. It only took a minute for it to become a, a little in there. gooey blob, and I felt that I was ready to add the rest. So, I carefully loaded in a small handful, and it looked like it was barely going to fit. At first, this was a bit concerning, because this was only a small fraction of what I had to add. With just a bit of poking around and stirring, though, yeah. it slowly It'll disappeared into the acid. 
It's a thing about substances that are high volume, but low density. I mean, he said earlier that acid had a higher had a higher mass, and now this is dilute acid mixed with some ice. All that together has significantly more mass than the cotton, so yeah, it'll go, it'll dissolve. I then continued adding the rest of the cotton, and I was honestly a bit worried <laughs> that it wasn't going to be able to eat the whole bag. Now, as far as I know, there was no major reaction Wouldn't going recommend on eating here, that. Not yet. and the cotton was just getting dissolved. I wasn't able to find much info about it, but it seems like the sulfuric acid was probably just interacting with the cellulose. It was forming a complex around their hydroxyl groups, which normally help the fibers stay tightly packed together. This was causing them to separate and fall apart and dissolve into the acid. It really didn't seem like it was going to work, but I was able to fit the whole bag. Now, at this point, things were looking pretty good, but to fully dissolve the cotton, yeah, yucky brown stuff. I had to warm it up a bit. So I dropped it into a hot water bath at 50 C and I let it sit there for 30 minutes. When it was done, it looked like all the cotton had disappeared and I pulled it out of the bath. I then poured it into 456 milliliters of boiling hot That's water. Cool watching that. This diluted the acid even more and it brought it down from the 75% that I had before to 27%. I then washed out the beaker with a bit of water to make sure that I transferred everything and I added a thermometer. Now, what if he did this with super mutated cotton? So the International Atomic Energy Agency partnered with a textile industry in Pakistan to create better cotton. So Pakistan can get very hot and heat stress in the cotton from increased temperatures, especially ones associated with global climate change, plus droughts can really impact the yield. So they exposed the seeds to some ionizing radiation, just some gamma radiation, to induce genetic mutation so they can develop more desirable traits such as increased heat resistance, cotton that is less reliant on irrigation and fertilizer, which can be hard to come by during the uh, drought season in Pakistan. This is one aspect that crazy nuclear mutations can be used for good. By the way, I'm saying this in jest. You're not going to cause mutations to turn somebody into the Hulk with gamma radiation in real life. But you can use it to make more cotton, which is pretty cool. I now had to keep this at 85C, and even though it didn't look like much was happening, it was the most important step. In the other one, the cotton had just been dissolved, but here, it was actually getting chopped up. The long cellulose fibers were being attacked by the acid and water, and they were breaking the bonds between the sugar units. This type of reaction is called a hydrolysis reaction, and they were breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces. Hydrolysis is so cool. That same process is how submarine crews can get some oxygen. The nuclear power plant they have on their submarine can not only propel the vessel, but all that extra energy can be used for hydrolysis, which is normally fairly energy intensive. But with the nuclear power plant, nuclear power plants can supply that. And it's the same sort of thing, breaking down water into its component pieces, hydrogen and oxygen. Another cool thing that nuclear power plants can do. I had to keep it running like this for two hours, and in that time... Just to clarify, the nuclear power plant itself doesn't do the hydrolysis of water. It supplies electricity to a machine that does that. Just thought I'd make that clear. It should fully break down into glucose. When it was done, it looked about the same, and I poured all of this into an even larger beaker. This one was surrounded with ice to help cool things down, <laughs> but little, it was the still going to take a while. So, in the meantime... I prepared something else that I needed. I went and got some of my food grade calcium carbonate, which is basically just chalk. I would be using this to neutralize all the sulfuric acid, but I couldn't just throw it in as a powder. Note that he says food grade. There's an additional standard for that the Food and Drug Administration uses for chemicals used for food versus, say, things that are just used in a chemical lab. That is to say, if you see sodium chloride salt in a chemistry lab that just says lab grade, don't eat it because it hasn't gone through the same packaging and um, sanitation requirements that something that is food grade has gone through. It's generally not the best idea to eat something in a lab anyway or a radiological controlled area. 
I had to make it into a slurry, and based on my calculations, I needed about 245 grams. So I measured that out, and added 125 mils of water. There it goes. I then stirred it around, and after a few minutes, it was good to go. When everything eventually cooled down to around room temperature, I started adding the goopy chalk. <laughs> Looks it about as foul as some protein shakes. with the sulfuric acid, and it was releasing a lot of CO2 gas. Ooh, okay. This was all being generated as the acid was being neutralized, and the acid itself was turning into calcium sulfate. I wonder if now red the buys carbon credits. The only problem was that I had to add the chalk in small amounts, or else it would bubble out of the to. beaker. <laughs> This was a very slow process, and it was going okay, until it eventually got a bit too thick. This happened because the calcium sulfate uh, was practically insoluble in water, and it was all separating out. Bad. Yeah. So to fix this, I occasionally added some extra water to loosen things up, and it seemed to help. I also added some more water to the chalk, and I slowly added the rest of it. he's not using that probe, that stick to kind of... There, there he goes, never mind. At some point, it really started looking way too much like iced coffee. <laughs> it kind of does. And it was does. a bit scary how much I wanted to taste it. Ooh. That would have been a horrible idea, though. And it's it would have tasted there, absolutely awful. But anyway, I was eventually done adding the chalk. And when I tested the pH, it told me that it was roughly neutral. Oh, never mind what then. I had now that was enough. was hopefully a mixture of calcium sulfate and dirty sugar water. And the next step was to filter it. Oh, I got poured it in as much as I could into the filter, but it wasn't even close to fitting everything. I was only able to add what looked like half of it, and I was gonna have to do this in two batches. It does kind of look like dirty as as I could, iced coffee I or iced on the milk. Vacuum, and I started pulling out the water. This was all being drained into a flask below the filter, and I was getting some nice and clear, dark liquid. When the stuff in the filter looked dry, I added some water. I then mixed it around, and I was doing this to wash out any sugar that might have been stuck in the calcium sulfate. One other thing I didn't mention earlier that cotton provides a important role for in nuclear applications is for radiation protection, and it's quite simple. It's the comfortable part of the protective clothing. While you could have some specialized things like lead lined garments, if it wasn't for cotton, those things would be so uncomfortable that no one would want to do any work within a radiological controlled area that required the use of uh, lead lined PPE. I know it's the same thing that cotton's used for another clothing, but it's something that I'm very glad we have. And a lot of radiation protective clothing is actually fairly comfortable. You usually have scrubs on underneath. This was then all pulled through, and I washed it a second time. Now I had to deal with the that other looks like half a bucket of the of stuff, paint. so I washed the filter, and I added everything that was Oof. left in the beaker. <laughs> it was all just barely able to fit, and I turned on the vacuum. Just like before, I pulled it all through, and I washed it twice with some water. In the flask below, I was left with a bunch of dark liquid. This was all hopefully some dirty sugar water, but up until now, I had no idea Red if I had actually made any sugar. To figure this out though, it was actually pretty easy, and I just had to use a glucose test strip. Oh, sure, yeah, that's This is true. normally used to check for sugar in pee, and I was a bit worried that it would tell me that there was nothing. However, there you it go, just actually like the gave me some really good results. The doctor's office. It told me that there was for sure glucose in there, and that there was probably a decent amount. The only problem was that it was still full of impurities, side products, and leftover acid, <laughs> and what I had to do next was try and clean it up a bit. The easiest way was to use something called a mixed ion exchange resin. At first, this might sound a bit fancy, and it kind of is, that's the same thing that we use in the condensate polishing system that I talked about earlier. That's actually the second stage um, ion exchanger 
First, we use, we call the cat bed resins or um, cat ions, so positively charged ions, because a lot of those, a lot of the big chunky ones that can come out of your, uh, of your turbine exhaust pass downstream from the condensate pumps. A lot of that water were the bigger ones from, but downstream of the uh, cat beds, then we go into the mixed beds, which includes a resin that's for cations and anions, it's kind of hard to say, uh, positive and negatively charged. So that's your, that's your second level of ion exchange that you go through. And when I say multiple levels, um, at the plant I worked at, we had six cat beds and six mixed beds all within the condensate polishing system. And those are just, again, just the ion exchangers, not the chem ads for things like uh, for additional chemicals such as um, hydrazine for um, oxygen scavenging. This is all, all those are just for, for conductivity control. And conductivity is just, a, and we measure this by looking at conductivity because pure water actually does not conduct electricity. It's the impurities in it that, which is why um, water is going to give you a nasty electric shock. And even though a lot of things are purified, there's still going to have a little bit of impurities that, that getting shocked when you're in water is really, really bad. But theoretically, if you were in 100% pure water, you wouldn't get shocked. Would not stress test that, though. But it's actually super simple to use. It's also commonly used to purify aquarium water, so it's pretty cheap and quite easy to buy. I got all my resin from Amazon. Just a small amount of the same stuff I'm used to. put it in this plastic tube. Now to clean the dirty sugar solution, I just had to pour it through. As it passed over the resin, it pulled out anything that was charged, and this included things like acid and salts. The sugar itself, though, was a neutral molecule, and it shouldn't have been affected by it. It even got rid of some of the color, and after just one run, it was looking a lot lighter. I then swapped out the beaker for another container, and I passed it all through again. I was doing this just to really make sure that I pulled out as much junk as possible. Now it's getting towards looking like healthy urine. When it was done, I washed the resin with some extra water, and at this point, it should have been relatively pure. Besides the obvious orange color, <laughs> there should have been practically no salts or acid. However, the main issue now was that there was still way too much water and I had to get rid of most of it. Mm. So after pouring it all into this large yeah, dish, in your casserole I dish. threw it into a food dehydrator. <laughs> okay, that's one way to do it. This is normally meant for things like peppers or fruit, and it's basically just a warm box with a fan. I then ran it until I felt that it was low enough, which ended up taking about 35 hours. After wow. that, I took it out and I poured it all into a beaker. It was just slightly over 400 mils, and now that it was more concentrated, it was a bit darker. It was also slightly acidic, mm, yeah, and it, looks it had acidic. a bit of a weird smell. This unfortunately meant that I had to go back to the eye. I'm used to seeing all the very different colors of urine because the, the biggest hazard probably associated with working at a uh, nuclear power plant is the heat stress. I mentioned earlier, there's not a whole lot of opportunities for real chemical hazards compared to say like an oil refinery or a petrochemical plant, but it can be get very hot at a nuclear power plant, especially the one in Texas that I worked at. So looking at signs of heat stress, heat stroke and dehydration. So in all the restrooms it's posted by um, what the safe colors of your pee should be. And it guides you on like, hey, you're doing just fine. You're doing okay, but you need to take some water all the way up to um, you need to see a medical professional immediately. That is one aspect of uh, safety we take very seriously is uh, heat stress and heat stroke and dehydration. On exchange resin. This time though, I did it in a different tube that I made from a water bottle. This one had a valve at the bottom that I could close so everything wouldn't pass through right away. I also included a bunch of activated charcoal along with the resin, which I was hoping would help with the smell and color. After everything was added, I stirred it around and then I let it sit there. 
I wasn't sure how long I had to leave it, and based on almost nothing, I decided that five hours was probably good. Look at that. Over that time, I just randomly stirred it every tornado. so often, and it's very it satisfying did get noticeably watch. lighter. When it hit the five hour mark, I opened the valve, and I drained everything out. Okay. I washed everything with a bit of extra water, and it was now hopefully cleaner. The only thing that I didn't like was that it looked a bit cloudy. To fix this, I tried pouring it through some cotton and sea light, but I don't think that did much of anything. It's just cool seeing him use the same sort of uh, mixed bed vessels, albeit at a much smaller size. Here's just a couple of ion exchange vessels that you would see in, in a power plant. So yep, on the order of several cubic meters worth. In any case, what I had now was still way better, and it no longer had a weird smell. Well, that's it good. basically just smelled like water, and it also wasn't acidic. The only issue was that there was still way too much water, so I put it back into the dehydrator. I then ran it rinse and until repeat, it looked like it was almost all gone. Of rinse and repeat. When I felt that it was done, I pulled it out, and I put it into an even smaller container. This one was made of silicone, and if I had made any sugar, I was hoping that it wouldn't stick to it. After that, I put it back That's in, a, and I ran it ahead there. until it looked like the volume stayed constant. When it eventually looked like it was Ever done, with sugar in the kitchen, I took know it out. exactly what he's talking about. I was really hoping to see some nice and crunchy sugar, but that of course wasn't the case. Only this part in the corner kind of looked like it was solid. I thought that maybe it was just having a hard time crystallizing, so I covered it and I put it in the freezer for a couple days. When I took it out, I thought- I love how much time and dedication and effort he puts into these, because like all these steps you're seeing in this uh, 30 minute or so video, it's like, Days later, hours later, more days later, more hours later. Now Red is an absolute professional when it comes to this. I thought it was looking really promising. And it looks like a solid. However, it wasn't. It was all goopy and mm. honestly a bit disappointing. Dirty but I jello. was still kind of happy. Even though it wasn't nice and crunchy, the texture more or less confirmed that it was sugar. Oh, you started with sugar. Sugar there in quotes. There were very many cotton. other things that I could have made here that would be sticky and gooey like this. I wasn't exactly sure why it wasn't completely solid, but I figured it was probably because I just didn't dry it enough. There was still some water in there making it all sticky, and unfortunately, I had to get it out. If I tried putting this into a cotton candy machine, it would be an absolute mess. <laughs> to dry I can it, imagine. I put together this little setup, which is just an upside down tray on a hot plate with a baking sheet on top. I then scraped off all the sugar, which totally stuck to the silicone, and I transferred it all here. I slowly turned up the heating, and I brought it up to just above 100C to boil off the water. I let it bubble like this for a while, and after several minutes, it was probably pretty dry. I still wasn't done though, because even with it dry, I knew that it That's still dry? wouldn't work to wow. make cotton candy. This was because I had already done a few basic tests using pure glucose, and it had completely Sad failed. Failure. I had no mm. idea why, but it only seemed to work when the glucose was partially caramelized. So, I slowly raised the temperature of the hot plate and I brought it up to 185C. Under this high heat, the sugar was hopefully caramelizing, which actually meant that it was repolymerizing. This was basically the exact opposite of what I did to make the sugar, okay. and I was rebuilding them back into slightly longer chains. It would still be edible though, and it would never go back to being like cotton. My only issue here was that I had no idea how long I had to heat it for, and I was also really afraid of burning it. I ended up letting it go until I felt that it looked good, which took about an hour. I then pulled it off the hot plate, and I waited for it to cool down to room temperature. 
After half an hour, it looked exactly the same, and for a second, I thought that it was still all goopy. When I poked at it, though, nice. it was completely solid, and it also looked and felt like candy. I was pretty happy with how it had turned out. It looks like an American football. It was a football. lot more sugar than I needed. It was also a lot more than I ever expected to get, especially after nice. my it's failures with the rock. enzyme. However, the yield was technically kind of crappy. It kind of reminds me of pralines. You know, you needed could have made cotton candy into pralines. I actually prefer pralines to, to cotton candy. And I only got about 20 grams. In theory, mm, I we had all that should water. have gotten at least 50. This meant that I had lost a lot along the way, and I honestly have no idea where it went. I'm thinking that a lot of it might have gotten trapped in the exchange resin. Well, you had the exchange resin, you had that, that filtery thing before where you had that weird the thing that looked like paint or iced coffee. So yeah, a lot of stuff can get lost in there which is kind of crazy there is there is an expense a purification expense if you will for how much of a uh, resource that is, that is going through or in all the calcium sulfate or maybe in general the process just wasn't super efficient I like the noise of it either cracking, way though. i never expected this process to be amazing and 20 grams was more than enough i was also it's honestly still kind of amazed that I'd even managed to get any sugar at all. Even though I had done this all myself, I still thought that it was hard to believe that this used to be a bag of cotton balls. <laughs> One thing though, looks very was that different, I still doesn't wasn't it? 100% sure that this was sugar. I mean, I had tested it with a glucose strip, it's like rock but candy. I felt that there was only one way to fully confirm it. Oh boy. Up until now, I had completely resisted tasting it, and I was really anxious to try it. If there was anything else in there, it would probably taste really bad or sour. Well, one of the ingredients was food grade. And I was grade. honestly kind of expecting that to happen. Ooh, he's, he's gonna eat it. Mmm, man. Taking one for science there, buddy. All in the name of science, all in the name of learning. But what if there was a way to learn about stuff that was completely free and also a lot less risky when you're rolling the dice on an experiment being edible or not. This brings us to our sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, computer science, and data science interactively. Whether you want to do a crazy synthesis project like Nile Red, or model nuclear accident response in a nuclear reactor simulator, computer science knowledge from Brilliant's courses will serve you well. And at your own pace, as little as 15 minutes per day, at whatever your skill level, whether you are still in high school or a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience, Brilliant customizes it to fit your needs. And it's gamified, so you get points and you get to track your process, which is really cool. You can get started for free for 30 days, and the first 200 get 20% off an annual plan by visiting brilliant.org slash tfulsnuclear. Click on the link down in the description. I guess I'll just taste one of the little pieces. Oh boy, here it comes. I mean, it tastes pretty good. Awesome. <laughs> it's just caramelized sugar. Nice. That's it. That's my whole review. <laughs> Done. <laughs> okay, so it was actually a lot better than I expected. Cool. And it didn't even have a hint of a weird flavor. But anyway, I guess it was now time to try and turn it into cotton candy. To do this, I figured that all I needed was a cotton candy machine, and I bought one from Amazon. Of course. Now, in theory, based on it. the instructions, all I had to do was wait for it to heat up and drop in my sugar. So I waited for about five or 10 minutes, and I nervously took out my precious little pieces. Well, after all that work I then going into them it. In, and I turned on the spinner. Just a little centrifuge. I was really hoping to see some nice puffs of cotton candy, but that didn't happen. All it did was shoot out a sad brown liquid. Oh, when I saw no. this, I was honestly pretty disappointed. Yeah. And I wasn't <laughs> sure why it failed. It, it just shot it all out. It just shot it out as liquid sugar. It just... <laughs> Based on my small tests, 
I was really expecting it to just work. But then again, I'm not some sort of cotton candy master. Cut. <laughs> it didn't work. See, that's what I feared. I can't say I'm a I cotton candy master either. Times, and it just Let me know down in the comments below if you're a cotton candy master. I'm not even sure what that is. Never seemed to work. At first, I had no idea why it was failing like this, but I started thinking that the melting point of my candy was just too low. If that were the case, it might just be having a hard time freezing as it flew through the air. This machine was designed for table sugar or sucrose, which melts at 186 mm, C, sure. but glucose melts around 146 C, and my sugar was probably even lower. I was hoping that this would have been fixed by caramelizing it, but I guess I didn't caramelize it enough. I think it just has to be more caramelized. So, I scraped off all the sugar from my sad and failed oh, attempts, look at that. and I put it back onto the silicone baking sheet. I then heated it up again to about 200 C. I had no idea how long I had to cook it for, and again, I was a bit afraid of burning it. Over 20 minutes, it darkened a bit more, and when I eventually felt that it was good, I took it off the heat. That would be, again, just knowing that if it, bad things happen if you get too hot, and bad things happen if you get too cold. Though I guess nothing really bad happens if you get too cold. You just have to redo it again. But burning of it, you can't really, you can't really come back from. But the, it's more of the idea of not having an operating band of what a, what a good temperature is for low or high or how long or any of that. Maybe I'm just so used to working with procedures in a nuclear power plant that I'd, I'd be nervous doing this. That is one thing is I was never really that nervous at the nuclear power plant because everything is so proceduralized and you're so prepared for things. But when you're doing stuff that there isn't really a book for, it can get pretty crazy. Plus, I've studied a lot more nuclear physics than, I guess, sugar processing, baking, or sugar science. I then let it cool down like before, and I broke it into a bunch of smaller pieces. Kay. Okay, so I was now ready to try again, and I was kind of expecting the same results. In theory, the caramelization should have fixed things, but I was a bit scared because if it didn't, I was kind of out of ideas. There was only one way to find out, though, and I dropped some way to make pieces into candy? the machine. I don't, I don't know. I then turned it on, and now I just had to wait. In the meantime, I got ready by climbing up on my little ladder. It was a little awkward, but I found that reaching over gonna the hit camera you in the face? was the only decent way to film this. I was half expecting it to almost immediately just shoot out as goo again, but that didn't seem to be happening. In fact, it didn't seem to be doing much of anything. It's kind of taking a lot longer. Get right on top of it. I kept waiting, and I was a bit worried that it would just burn or something, but then there was suddenly a bunch of nice fluff. I then quickly used the stick, Here and I tried come, collecting yeah. it, and it was actually working. The first thing that I noticed, though, wow. was that it looked a lot thicker than regular cotton candy. I He's mean, making hay. it was all yellow, and the machine sounded like it was dying, but it was still <laughs> pretty exciting. When it eventually looked like it wasn't making anymore, I turned off the machine. Oh. My god. <laughs> okay, so apparently it had worked, and even though it was probably the saddest and most pathetic cotton candy I've ever seen, It's like I've a little straw seen, hat on a little toy scarecrow. I was scarecrow. still really happy with it. But that's really cool really what he did. I wanted to know how it tasted. I mean, it tastes like regular cotton candy. Wow. Just a lot more burnt. <laughs> it's burnt. That is it's cool. It's not bad, but it's, it's also not good. The only major issue with it, besides looking and tasting like industrial grade cotton candy, <laughs> was that it didn't last very long. Industrial grade cotton. Yeah, it does kind of look like something you'd make from, uh, dirty brackish runoff that you expect to see in the waste pile uh, after the uh, from the condensate polishing system or something. Even though it was able to solidify, it seemed like it wanted to melt. 
In just a few minutes, it had shrank quite a bit, and it had gotten a lot harder. All the work. All of my work to get this. <laughs> Before it completely died, though, I broke off a piece of it, and I compared it to a cotton ball. <laughs> In my opinion, they were shockingly similar, and the cotton candy kind of just looked like a really used and dirty yes, one. Yes, that is awesome. But anyway, awesome. in the end, I guess I was successful back to square at one. turning cotton balls into Except cotton you can candy. I mean, it wasn't the most efficient transformation, and the quality wasn't exactly the best, but it was still a lot better than I expected, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. For now, though, I think I'm done messing around with sugar, and I'm going to focus on some other projects, like turning plastic gloves into hot sauce. That was another really good Nile Red video. I've enjoyed... Thanks so much for all the recommendations for these. This, uh, it's cool and very relaxing to see his overall processes and how similar a lot of these. I wasn't expecting him to use a uh, mixed bed resin, one that was very similar to the condensate polishing system used at the nuclear plant. It's funny how everything seems to be related, which is just fascinating. Something that's always fascinated me. And thank you very much to Brilliant for sponsoring. Again, you can get started for free for 30 days and the first 200 get 20% off an annual plan by clicking the link. Brilliant.org slash Nuclear. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.